Hello to everybody joining us online and welcome to our product school show today. I am so excited. I'm Chantelle Depre, product marketing manager here at product school and joining me today we have Jeremy Henriksen, SVP of product at Rippling. How's it going, Jeremy? It's going great. Uh, good evening to you, I guess, in Paris. Uh, it's nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you as well. We thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you here. We've got a pretty packed agenda of ways that we want to pick your brain and see how product is truly done at Rippling. So I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, pass it over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal history, how you got started in product and who you are? Sure. Uh, so maybe I, I'll go way back. Uh, I grew up in uh, South Dakota, born in Minnesota, but grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, I was just a shy kid who like really liked like problem solving and puzzles. I was blessed with three little brothers. And so I made games for them like all the time. And while I didn't think of that as product, um, what I realized kind of later in life was like the seeds of like the product person I was going to be was going to become like were born of like creating those experiences um, for them. And, you know, that later translated into like learning how to code on my Apple II Plus and basic and writing adventure games. And eventually, like, you know, once I got to college, it became my thing. And I was a computer science guy. But I, I very quickly realized that at least for me, like the engineering was like super interesting. But like what I really loved was like the interactions with people around computers, or around each other, around computers and around other kind of computing devices. Um, and while at the time, you know, there was no like product management discipline or, or, or school or thing you could go to, um, I realized that that was sort of where I was kind of kind of headed toward. And so um, to make a relatively long story short, after I finished graduate school, I was at this uh, company called Reactivity, which was part of the Internet One era. And no one really knew how to use the internet at the time. And so we were doing consulting and starting new companies um, around like, hey, how do you use this internet thing? And what interesting things can you do with it? And so in that in, in the process of doing that, I talked with like dozens of companies that were trying to get off the ground, figuring out how to build their products. Um, and um, that's where I really became, I would say, a product manager, even though I didn't have the title product manager until my next job at uh, Guidewire back in the back in the aughts. Um, and then kind of the rest is sort of history. I've been been a sort of hybrid product engineering design person like ever since. Um, and I've just kind of really loved the last of 20 years or so of, of doing that kind of kind of thing. We definitely didn't talk about this and we are going through the questions, but you said that you are into computer science is probably what you studied. If you had to go back and redo your education, would you study the same thing? 100%. I mean, well, okay, hold on. Uh, so I'm also sort of a musician. So maybe if I were to do it again, I would go become a conductor, even though I eliminated that as a career choice in my 20s. Uh, so I love music. But like, if I were going to become a product manager again, um, 100% computer science um, engineering would be is the right place to start. Because I think as a product leader, I think it's extremely difficult to make good choices unless you actually understand the implications of those choices in software um, and what it means for an engineer to actually have to build something or make a trade-off between like getting something out tomorrow or like architecting it the right way and getting it out two days later or, or whatever. Um, and so I think having that deep hands-on experience of having built stuff you know, written code and like getting pretty good at it, I think is a, is a really important kind of background element to many great product leaders. Amazing. Well, you know, that brings us to a great segue to our next question, which is as product people, we always reinforce this idea of falling in love with a problem and not just the solution. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the problems you're passionate about solving at Rippling? Yeah, sure. So, um, I think when I've, I'd like to let me answer like a little bit of like context about how I think about like choosing places to work because Rippling is just a great example of that. Um, and for me, it's about believing that there's something like fundamentally transformative about, about the thesis of the company. Um, and so in Rippling's case, the, the thesis is the problem statement is that today's systems are all super disconnected before Rippling. You have a payroll system and it has like your name and your email address in it and your kind of address. You have an insurance system, which has the same thing. You have a device management system and a recruiting system and a time and attendance system. You have dozens of systems at companies and like none of them are the source of truth. None of them. And so what ends up happening is you have either really janky integrations between all these systems, which like poor IT people desperately try to keep up. But that's that's never good enough because you also have to have human beings like uh, update this data. So if I move from here in sunny California to Paris, 
right? Well, somebody has to make that change in the system and make sure they're making the right changes at the right time. And it's, and it's an enormous burden and it's not fun and it's extremely error prone. Um, and it's not good. And this has happened because there's been a disaggregation of systems over the last two decades. Um, that is a big, hairy problem, especially when you extend it beyond there to like the community of like thousands of other like ancillary products that companies need to use, all of which, by the way, are also dependent on understanding that employee data. And so for me, that's just a, a problem that's really, really rich with like possibility and like a decade's worth, at least for my intellect of like of, of finding interesting things to think about. Um, and extremely importantly, I believe that of the many potential solutions, like the one that we have chosen is just like fundamentally good for people. Um, and, and it's not just about falling in love with the problem for me, but it, but it's all, I have kid, two kids now, they're eight and six. Um, when I started this job, they were you know six and four. And it's really important for me to be able to tell them, hey, look, here's how your dad's spending time. And like, I'm actually making people's lives better and here's the way in which I'm making it better. And that's something I actually can explain to my kids now, which which I value very highly. Amazing. Well, let's dive into that a little bit more. What's an mm -hmm. example of a product that your team has launched recently or built recently that you're super proud of? Oh, man, there's so many. Um, uh, but I think I have to go with our global launch. So maybe a month, month and a half ago, we announced that, you know, we were going global. And what does that mean for us? Well, up until, you know, very recently, um, we basically just served United States based companies and their United States based employees and contractors. And like we had integrations that would like, you know, allow you to pay people in, you know, France or UK or India or wherever. Um, but that experience is not the unified like single system experience you want. And so we've done a ton of work over the last year extremely quickly to be able to say, no, 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 no. Not only can we directly support like your employees in Canada and the India and the UK and everywhere else in the world. And we've now been paying our own employees via our own systems. The inexperience, it's like one button. You don't have to do this four different times in four different places and like wait forever. It's just a like, seamless, like magical experience, which is really cool. And not only can we do that, but we're also about to be able to support companies that are not headquartered here. Right. So if you're a Canadian company with Canadian employees, and you happen to have remote employees in the United States or somewhere else. Well, that's going to work, too. And, you know, and ditto for all the rest of the companies. And so that launch has been has been really, really fun in a number of dimensions. Like one, it's just a complicated thing, right, to make that work, to go from like one country to many countries. Two, it requires a cultural change, which is one of the things I always love about companies when they go global. You end up kind of have, you, you end up like leaving this extremely kind of United States centric point of view with color spelled incorrectly and the word zip code in there and all those things to everybody in the company needing to think about why what they do every single day needs to be thought of in a different, like more global way. And I, I love that transformation inside of a company that happens when you do it. And I'm just like really, really proud of the team for have being able to like affect that transition in such like a relatively short um, period of time. It's the second time that you mentioned that it has been a fast or short period of time that this has <laughs> happened. I want to dive yeah. in there. Can you can you expand a little bit more on that and maybe some of the hurdles that are sometimes associated with moving fast? Yeah, so I think um, one has to be very, very careful to say like fast does not equal bad. Right. Fast just me. Fast to me is not about like the move fast break things philosophy that <laughs> Facebook made famous. Right. Fast is about focus. Right? It's about understanding what you need to build and not wasting time and energy and effort like doing things that you don't like that aren't productive towards your end goal. And like sometimes you don't sometimes you don't, like, don't have that benefit. Sometimes you, you don't know what the end goal is. Right. And you have no choice but to like, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall in a bunch of different ways. And it's really frustrating when things don't work out. But for us, like we more or less know what we need. The question is, how do you do it? How do you do it effectively in a different way? Um, and, and leveraging for us, you know, this single source of truth that we have on the platform that we've built around that. Um, and, 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 and so going quickly is all about having a deep, deep understanding of the domain and a deep, deep understanding of our kind of differentiators as a platform and like getting the whole team aligned kind of toward that, that set of work. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, being demanding about timelines, like, wait, why, why is this going to take until like 
February 1st? Why can't it take till January 1st? And like you talk about that question, right? And you realize people have all these assumptions in their heads about the things they need to do in order for it to like, you know, happen by February 1st. But like, oftentimes, those things are not necessary, not to building a great product, right? If they're necessary to building a great product, then you have to do them. But sometimes they're not, right? And so like really understanding what matters and what doesn't, I think is the key to like moving very, very quickly. And then of having a culture of like, deciding things now, like you could wait to schedule a meeting next week with a committee of seven people, or you could like call Slack, call somebody like literally right now, get them on the line and make the best decision you can. And like, are you going to make wrong decisions every once in a while? Sure. Right. But if they're reversible, it's not a big deal. And most of the decisions are, are, are not that are not of that caliber. And so we really, really bias toward making decisions as quickly as we can. I love that. For the folks who maybe are thinking of applying to work at Rippling, can you give us the sneak peek about what, like, are you guys using an OKR framework? How are you coming up with these things that say we prioritize moving fast and making decisions quickly? So I don't think you can really capture that in in like numbers usually like of course there are numbers that we are trying to like to, to manage toward like hey how many support tickets are there or you know how many customers are using this feature or how often are they using that thing um but for us there, there's a more fundamental thing which is just like when we build a new product and we don't really bring like tiny features to, i mean we do bring tiny features to market but like if you're a product leader here like you own the product <laughs> right in, in the market and so the question is how do we make this a great differentiated product, both for ourselves as and we are our most difficult customer by far, right? Um, and then, you know, how do we make sure that customers are going to kind of accept and, and use it? And like, that's the litmus test. And for us, it's about, do you understand the ways in which having a single system of record allows you to build like a highly differentiated product? And so as a product leader here, you're thinking about those things, right? You're thinking about how can I create this experience? How can I think it all the way through such that like, everyone from like the VP of the function down to an employee to that manager over there to the business partner to the partner that's like using this all have this like sublime experience like going through it where it's just like is is an experience they could not have had should hit should they have chosen any other system and like that's the metric and it, it is in some ways a subjective judgment um, but once you've been here for a while like it becomes like super clear like what that what the the kind of dimensions of that subjective judgment are very cool. Amazing. So how do you find ways to motivate your team and perform in this hyper growth scenario you've got going on at Rippling? Yeah, it helps to have the hyper growth there. Um, so so for us, it's, you know, we, we believe in keeping the product organization like relatively thin. Um, and what that means is that as a product leader here, you come in and you have a very large scope of responsibility, um, perhaps even slightly unreasonably large, <laughs> so it's deliberately. But then you're saying like, look, this is yours. You are expected to be like the expert in this zone. You're expected to lead the rest of the company um, in doing this. And so the way, the way I try to motivate people is by persuading them of like the significance and depth of that role, which is like very different from places people have usually come from, um, and then to actually hold them accountable for it. And it's in the holding accountable, like, wait, you expect me to do that in my first week? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> totally, right? And and people like get understanding that like, this is a career accelerator, right? Because you're doing you're you're doing so much, the scope of ownership is is so broad. And then of course, I'm there to coach and support them, right? I'm, I'm a relatively like, um, hands off is probably the wrong word, but like let people like do their own thing and then like be there to support them or catch them or say, uh, I don't think you're approaching this right to intervene and say like, here, what can I do to make sure you're going to be successful um, in this? Um, and I found that, you know, it's not always a cultural fit. Like every once in a while we make a hiring mistake and like that doesn't work out. But like when it does work out, people are extremely motivated to like do their very, very best work. Um, and, and, and they feel like super proud of what they've been able to build. And so as long as I can keep like doing things in such a way that people feel like really proud of the work they've done and feel like they're having an opportunity to have that ownership, I think we'll do okay. Very cool. This is kind of just going a little bit deeper into that mm -hmm. question, but how do you find ways to support career progression of your teams? Uh, so I think career progression is a funny thing, right? Because different people define it differently. Um, at, at, you know, it's, for some people, career progression is I want to manage a lot of people. Um, that kind of career, career progression is like not really here at Rifley. Like, yeah, there are people who manage people, but like the, the, the objective is not to like acquire like the most massive team that you can. Um, 
the objective is to truly lead um, your product area and become the expert. Like, and the, and, and the ideal state is like, look, you should, you know, Parker, who's our founder and has like this brilliant product find for like the, the, the suite of products we have, you know, all he wants is for, to be able to have product leaders who, whose areas he can ignore to say like, look, I could drop off the face of the universe for six months or for a year and come back and be blown away at the state of the product. Right. And that is career progression in product, like achieving that ideal state. Right. And all of the things you have to do to go from being really, really good at building a feature to like owning a product. And like that is a very, very long. I mean, that took me 20 years. <laughs> like, and I'm still learning. Right. And so and, and so I think like making sure that people recognize that that's that is the opportunity here. All right. And, and look, I think there are different there are different kinds of like product leadership and product ownership that, that people can have. And Rippling is going to be right for some people and not for others. But for people who do like that kind of style, Rippling, I think is a really great place to, to learn and, and grow through people's careers. Very cool. Again, I'm trying to give you the plug for all those folks hoping to work at Rippling. Can you talk <laughs> us through in a little bit more detail, like what kind of roles in product teams exist at Rippling? What is the area of possibility there? Yeah, I mean, we have so we have roles kind of across the board. I'll, I'll give I'll give us a few examples of ones that are right now. So I, I mentioned the global release, um, and so we are looking for a product leader on that team to be the leader for a number of countries in the world, right? be the expert in Germany is already taken. <laughs> Germany is like one of them, like France, all the rest, like we're going into all the major countries in the world. Um, and we need people who are willing to go deep there. Um, we are looking for a leader for our insurance and benefits products. So this is like a more mature product, which still has a ton of innovation, particularly the roots back to the global stuff, right? We went global and now suddenly we need to support global benefits in every country in the world. Right. And that, that's not, that's not an easy, not an easy gig. Um, we have kind of earlier stage, like new products. We always kick off new products with just an engineer. But once like we've like built like that first version of the product, there are kind of earlier stage places where like product leaders can, can be a really, really great fit um, as well. We have a few examples of that within our finance suite. Um, so there's a few, few kind of examples of the kinds of things we're hiring for. Very cool. Very, very cool. Okay, you have obviously excelled as a leader, and it sounds like you're pretty passionate about leading products over at Rippling. Can you share some of the ways that you've built up those leadership skills and how you're continuing to develop and challenge yourself today? Yeah, I learned long ago that I learned by doing, like, in college, like I was way better at the project courses than I was at the ones where you fill out bubbles at the end of the thing and get like test scores. Um, and so for me, it's always just been about, I, I learn by doing, I find something I'm either not good at or want to be better at or whatever. And like, I'll go do it. And so as, as an, and as an example right now, um, we're working on a couple of kind of capabilities for large customers, like headcount planning and compensation bands and the like. And I decided, hey, this is an area I'd just like to know more about. And so um, I've been working directly with a product leader kind of, of, of that zone. We've just been building the thing um, together for the last couple of months, um, which has helped me really understand that domain particularly, but also a new set of platform capabilities that we've been building, which I understood at like a high level, but hadn't yet gone deep on. And so this kind of constantly like kind of revisiting things that I used to know or things that are like are, are new or whatever, something I just try to build in um, to my cadence as much as as much as I can, um, because I find I can only be a good product leader if I actually know like the details of what's going on. Very cool. I think I'm saying very cool to all of your answers, but it's because I'm finding them extremely engaging. <laughs> So. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. I, 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 I like to think of them as like hard learned lessons, but also like totally wrong sometimes. Everyone, somebody's going to say something else to me. I'm like, wow, you know what? I should have been doing it that way and not, not this other way. So um, it's good. Well, everyone's path is like the curvy way, right? There's yes. no one yes. way. Otherwise, even if there was, I mean, that's why we all talk about the matrix and waking up from the matrix, right? So better to yeah. have an interesting life than a straightforward boring <laughs> one. 100% agree. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we are on the cusp of December, last month of the year. Um, it's not necessarily last month of the quarter for everybody, depending on your fiscal year. But as we look forward to the new year, can you tell us a little bit about what are your top three goals going into the new year or for the new year? Yeah. Um, so so uh, there's a set of things I could talk about and not talk about. Um, 
you know, obviously this global expansion piece is like enormously important to us. Um, we think that companies will only succeed in the next five or 10 years in our domain if they can serve companies globally. Um, and oddly, I think a lot of companies are not positioned to be able to do that. Um, but we want to make sure that we are like the de facto answer there. And so that's a huge area of emphasis. Um, a secondary of emphasis for us is like larger customers. Um, so, you know, we have customers that range from like, you know, two people in a garage, you know, up to like, you know, five, 6,000 folks. Um, but we want to continuously kind of push, push those boundaries up and make it a, like a really great product for the 10,000 person company, which I think we could serve that customer today, but it's not as good as I want it to be, right? And so we can do it, we can do it better. And that's partly just like, hey, we have to build some other products we haven't built yet, um, and partly a few other kind of capabilities. And so that's really important to us as well. Um, and again, we are our own most difficult customer here, and we're never ever gonna use any product other than ourselves. So I have faith that we'll do that scaling. Um, uh, and then I would say like also the, the other thing that's kind of changed structurally is like Parker can only do so much, right? Like he, he you know, he's kind of a, a force of nature. Um, but from a product organization standpoint, um, the leaders of each of these functions need to be able to pull all the way up and like be the source of truth for the company on those things. And historically, Parker has always had to dive in um, because he's wanted to be really hands on and understand the product really well. But like we're out scaling that. And so helping my project leaders get to a point where they can serve that function um, as well as Parker does is a huge emphasis of, of the next year. Got it. Got it. Those are some some big goals that you've set out. Yeah. Do you think that you'll accomplish those within the next twelve months? Yes. Okay. Amazing. Yeah, and I, don't I, think it's gonna be, I don't think it's gonna be easy, right? I think, and if there's things like that will go like particularly well. There's things that you know we'll struggle with, right? Like like any journey, doing something that hard. But um, one thing I have faith in is our ability to execute. <laughs> so we've done okay there. Very cool. Very cool. So I want to go back on a point that you mentioned. You said that you don't think a lot of companies are fully adopting that mindset of go global or don't be here in the next decade to kind of reframe mm -hmm. what you said. Why do yeah. you think that is? Um, actually, don't even necessarily think it's not that they don't have that that frame of mind, though. It, you know, in our market, like many companies have grown up being like just U.S. only or just like Germany only or just like some other company only. And it's a technical problem because like once if you baked in those assumptions like into the code extremely deeply and the culture of the company doesn't have like this, this understanding of global stuff, it's extremely difficult to like escape like that gravitational pull. And so, um, so number one, I don't think everyone's had the realization that they're going to have to be global. And then to the extent people have had the realization, I just think the, the, the path to get there is much more difficult for some companies than others. And, and by the way, I do think there are companies that will make it right for, for sure. Like, you know, there's, there's other smart people in the world, but, but, um, but I think it's a challenge. It's a really challenging thing to do. Well, it requires a, a deep commitment to a very clear path. And then of course you have to have like, the people that, that can do the work. Um, and so I think we're lucky to have all three of those, but like some companies are just gonna have a harder road than, than we are. Well, maybe the road will be a little easier if they use Rippling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> True. True. <laughs> all right, let's go back to some of your more career path um, and your, your experience growing as a product leader question. So how would you disambiguate the product career path or roadmap? Yeah, so I think um, for me, I draw a distinction between uh, people who are like really good at like the process of product management versus product, <laughs> right, right? And I, I personally value the latter of those two things far more than, than the former. Um, because I think the moment you talk about like tools and process and, and like all those things, you're, you're, you're not talking about the fundamental thing, which is building something that's going to be correct for the customer, right? And so, you know, for, for my, you know, my personal journey has been one of having like just barely enough process to be able to like hold together like a rational like plan, right? And then everything else is about setting things up to get to the right decisions for the product or the best decisions you can make at a given point in time. They're not always right, but at least the best decisions you can make at a given point in time. And then, in my view, like the best product leaders are good at that and then are really good at spreadsheets <laughs> to, to like, you know, tie a bunch of stuff together. And then when you have to, like you get good at Jira or something, 
right? And then and then you have to be good at mockups, but like that's that's it, <laughs> right? That every everything else is kind of noise. Um, and there are definitely things you need to do in order to scale companies. There are definitely things you need to do in order to run large teams, and those things are all fine. But they're secondary relative to getting the product as right as possible. Okay, so getting that product as right as possible, I'm guessing that there is some piece of insight there about how to do that. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's a, a magic, a silver bullet here. I mean, for, I, can tell, I can tell you what it is for me. Um, and for me, it's two things, right? It is number one, having as deep a possible understanding of your domain, right? And that is a necessary but not sufficient uh, uh, um, criteria. And the second one is you have to have a thesis which you're applying to that problem, right? Something that makes your particular solution you know, an order of magnitude better than whatever came before. And so understanding how to apply that thesis to that problem in a way that creates a uniquely better solution um, is, is the kind of other, the other piece of, of magic. And then being able to divine like a, a additional things that kind of, kind of accrue to that thesis. Like, so for example, at, at Rippling, like the initial thesis was, hey, look, you need a single system of record. Right. And that was enough to start building something that was very different. But now that's evolved to a whole platform of capabilities where permissions that can be determined based on any attribute of the user, workflow and automation that's aware of the organization, a degree of configurability that lets every company do whatever they need to do idiosyncratically, um, a deep and, and systemic reporting infrastructure shared commenting, all of these different things, which were there at the beginning of the thesis, but have been additive to it. And now anytime you build a new product at Rippling of any scale, you think through this library of differentiators and say, wait a minute, I can do this set of things that no one else in the market can do because I can take advantage of not just the thesis, but the set of things that have grown around it. And so it's the combination of understanding the problem deeply and understanding the differentiators deeply that if you, if you can bring it together, and like stay grounded in what customers actually need, which is the other hard thing to do. Um, you can build a great product. Amazing. We are coming up to almost time. So I'm gonna close things out with one last question, which is if you had a time machine and you could go uh -huh. back to the very beginning to your younger self when you're first starting out, what advice would you give yourself to get further in your product career? Oh man, I uh, it's a great question. I, I think there are two things that I would tell myself. Um, number one is that accomplishing anything significant is always hard and is always unreasonable, right? I spent a lot of time struggling when I was younger with this like balance between, well, how, how hard do I wanna work or how much do I wanna commit myself to my work? And you kind of have to make a call. <laughs> it's like either you're committed to your work or you're not. But second, you also have to know what else you need to be like happy and satisfied in your life. And you have to, you have to make sure that you construct your life. So you have time for that too. And while it, there can be a tension between those two things, I think finding as early as possible in your career, like what, like really understanding what you truly need and what you truly care about um, that personal journey, that introspection, like, you know, the going through the fire, like, I wish I'd been able to go through more of that earlier because the point I'm at now, I'm like super happy. I have these two kids that, you, you know, I read to every day. I finished reading Lord of the Rings to my son, like last week and we're watching the movies, like totally awesome. Coming to a place where like, I understood that's the balance I wanted was really hard. And so I wish I would have had like somebody in my life, like back then who could have like helped point me a little more in that direction. Well, there's always options for mentorship with product school, and I'm sure you have tons yeah. of people flooding into your DMs, if not before, definitely after this session, <laughs> going, well, <laughs> here I am. Help me out. So, wonderful. Awesome. No, I look forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for joining us. We are fully at time. I'm going to close us out with our awesome video, but any last remarks that you want to give us before we switch over to that? No, thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been fun chatting with you, and I, I appreciate the time. And thanks you to everyone who's listening for uh, spending time tuning in. Amazing. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Have a great rest of your day.